Good morning, folks. Hey, Duffy. This might be a very quiet meeting. Okay, we're getting some folks in here. Neat, neat, neat. I was gonna say, I hope it's not too quiet. <laughs> like, I see four people and two of them are me. No, it's fine. We're going to give folks a few more minutes to join before we get started. Hello. Hello. We're going to wait one more minute and see if we have got more folks join us. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us today. As a reminder, we all um, abide by the antitrust policy notice. And if you have made it today, you know where the meeting is. We thank you for uh, joining us. Next slide. We have several TOC members here today, but we won't be making any decisions on the agenda. We're gonna talk a little bit about security audits, um, some common issues and findings from them, how the TOC uses them, how the maintainers use them and potential improvements, um, or even identifying existing challenges between maintainers or TOC members when reviewing the audits for projects and in an effort to just improve the overall experience for all parties involved. Um, we have with us, David and Adam from AdaLogix, who are gonna first run through kind of a little bit about their audits. If you were uh, present at the last KubeCon, they had a presentation on this, which is kind of what sparked this discussion. Um, and then run through some challenges and issues that they, they come across, and then we'll open it up to a little bit more of a discussion um, around how are maintainers feeling about the audits, what are some of the challenges in that process that they're experiencing, and some of the recommendations that we have moving forward. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Adam, David, I'll hand it over to you. Hey, I'm David from AdaLogix, and yeah, we started with Emily reaching out during KubeCon uh, a few months ago where we had given a talk about sort of, we have done, I think, uh, five to 10 security audits of various CNCF projects now. We have written reports and we have done it <clears throat> quite several times now. And uh, we gave a presentation about how they, they usually go and various aspects of them. And Emily reached out after the conference and basically had sort of the, the, the high level query of, there are some, 
uh, parts about the so gave the kind of like problem statement that the TSE are using these uh, reports we deliver to assess the overall security of CCF projects. And uh, she had some ideas about how we could improve the report such that this decision making becomes perhaps, uh, I don't know if I should say easier, but becomes a bit more uh, qualified in a sense. So essentially help that process, uh, not do your work, but give the right information such that you can give a correct assessment. And I think this is a, is a, is a great idea. And I think a key point there is that we have essentially never discussed with the TSC or so to understand what are the things you try to extract from the uh, from the security reports uh, to, to enhance your decision making. So that's uh, also something that's very useful from, from our side to direct it towards the, the correct people. Because in general, when we write these uh, reports, there are various stakeholders at place, both the maintainers, both the CNCF, the ones that pay us, and both the um, sort of like the companies that often run these uh, projects and so on. And then obviously the TOC is also a, a major stakeholder here. And I don't know if I should say the companies there are, are, are also a stakeholder, but it's indirectly they kind of are, I guess, uh, as they are affiliated with the maintainers. Um, so that's the key point of the, of the discussion. Um, and to sort of lay the groundwork, we're going to give a short presentation of how our audits usually go, the timeline and what are the technical aspects we look for and what are the, the outputs of it. So usually the engagements are five weeks long, plus minus a few. And sometimes they extend a little bit based on how kind of how, how well we synchronize with the teams during the audit. So sometimes they will have some, they will not have the, 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 a lot of time for the audits in certain periods. So we have to kind of like, it's a fairly flexible process in that sense. It's estimated at five weeks and we do a lot of navigation during that time to ensure enough, like the proper work is done. And also we meet the maintainers, uh, we, we meet the maintainers schedule. So they usually start with having a, an introductory meeting. Uh, either the first day or a few days before the, the, the audit starts, where we discuss sort of logistics, communication channels, outline expectations. They can give us input, for example, if they have focus areas, if they have certain concerns, and they can just give us a lot of information that they feel is relevant. And we'll kind of uh, incorporate that into our audit process. And basically the audit then starts uh, there can be a lot of different tasks depending on each audit, depending on the project. Um, but sort of an invariant is we often have uh, meetings, either weekly or bi-weekly, and this is depending on, on what the maintainers uh, uh, want and sort of like prefer. And we try to engage with the maintainers on their terms. So either through email, Slack, or other means. And usually it's Slack. Um, Adam, correct me if I'm wrong. And the output of the, the, the report, sorry, the output of the engagement is a, a mix of things. Fundamentally, it's a report. Uh, that's kind of like the deliverable we give to the CNCF. But then there's also a lot of upstream code changes, upstream document, documentation changes, security advisories, threat models, uh, security policies, and various types of things. Um, so those are also uh, outputs of the sort of artifacts as output of the of the orders. Um, we have a list of uh, all the orders uh, carried out. And to say here that there's also other companies that do this. Uh, we, we generally follow a similar structure as far as I'm aware. The reports have a, a, a lot of similarity in terms of uh, composition. And I think also uh, we draw inspiration from each other. So often when sort of one company come out, comes out with a new idea or a new way to present things, other companies might follow along and, and, and vice versa and so on. Right. So, if, if I can just add uh, about the reports, they are all uh, public um, uh, without exception. So so they are meant to, to be shared with the community and other people that want to continue the work or kind of are curious about what kind of security issues uh, the, uh, a given project faces. So that context is super. Uh, and, and we do write the reports in, in, a, in a way where we try to have section that is more uh, appropriate for various stakeholders. So just to, to put a note here is that it would be 
uh, great to have some form of like a section that is primarily targeted the TOC almost. Um, and it's just about scoping out what, what that the section should be. And also in a sense, uh, what it should be while still focusing on we should, on all the other aspects should not lack because like it shouldn't confuse the, the, the reader in a sense. But anyway, so just keep that in mind. Um, I'm going to go on the goals because it sounded like you were talking about some of the goals in here. Like, happy to be able to like, come back to slider things. Cool. So, uh, what are the goals of the various security audits? We have. Yeah. So I, I can take this one, David, if you if you want. Yeah. So uh, we we typically have um, four to five formal goals for a security audit, and they are they are often very different, um, and that is on purpose. So. Um, some typical goals are to do some threat modeling of the, or do do a threat model, perform a threat model of, uh, or get a threat model of the project that we are audit auditing, um, do a manual audit of the code base, and uh, the documentation, and the, perhaps the examples that uh, that users are presented uh, to get started with with the project. Um, uh, another goal is to look at the the test suite, both uh, yeah, for for example, the first first test suite, see if we can improve it, um, and make an assessment of how it is, uh, how how well it covers uh, critical areas of the code, uh, and we also uh, will consider um, and assess the static analysis um, tool tool chain of uh, the project, and also add add more tools or. Um, assess uh, findings that uh, the project might not, might have skipped um, in their in their own work. Um, so so those are, for example, four, four very uh, typical goals that we will um, that we will have uh, in, have outlined before we start an audit. Um, so uh, we have listed some bullet points here: threat modeling. Um, we will look at the the typical threats and uh, attack vectors of a project to and put ourselves in the in the position of an attacker to see how we would um, assess a project and how we could damage uh, the project. Uh, and the threat model is useful for pretty much all the other goals that we are uh, achieving in the audit. So we use the threat model when we audit the code. We use the threat model when we um, assess the fuss, fuzzing of the project. And also when we um, assess the static tooling of uh, of the project, um, typically we start with a threat model and it continues throughout the audit um, and uh, helps throughout the entire uh, in the entirety of the the five weeks. Um, then we uh, audit the code manually for bugs and security issues, um, considering the threat model very very closely. Um, when doing that, um, we check the, the fuzzing. Um, we do a lot of fuzzing ourselves, so typically we will also contribute new new fuzzers and um, add them to the project's OSS fuzz integration, so they run continuously. Um, and uh, yeah, so there will there will be a separate uh, part of the audit as well. Um, we will also work with the project on uh, the, on um, so, so if, if in case we find a, a se severe issue, we will typically run it through the project's um, security disclosure policy, pretty much to kind of battle test, especially if the project has never had any advisories, security advisories, we will we'll run it through the security uh, disclosure policy so that they go through the process of receiving a community uh, um, based uh, at, uh, disclosure and taking it all the way uh, through to um, making a, a CV, uh, issuing a CVE and uh, creating a public uh, advisory. Um, and yeah, so so that we do that with uh, if if we have if we see a clearly uh, severe issue and sometimes the project will also do it, uh, it itself. They, they will receive a, a list of findings at the end of the audit and then they will uh, assess um, each and uh, all of them, uh, and if the, if they consider an issue to be severe, uh, they will uh, create the CVE themselves. And we have experienced both both uh, sides of that. We also look at how a project maintains the source code. So, how many reviewers are there? Uh, do do commits need to be signed, etc. 
Uh, we will also assess the re release process, uh, how are artifacts built and shared? Do they uh, conform to uh, industry standards um, in that part of the project maintenance? And finally, deployment and, and usage. Um, so when a, pro when a user deploys or consumes the, 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 soft, the, the product, uh, the software product, are they secure uh, or are there, uh, is, it, is the project insecure by default or are there some security um, holes that they can very easily fall into? So um, is it easy to uh, open up uh, certain attack vectors um, and are these docu well documented in the in the project's documentation? So yeah, that that's it for 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 the goals as a as a high level. And just to clarify, uh, you initially said that the goals are usually different on purpose, and the main point is here we kind of debate these things with with the maintainers and like the project the project that we are working with uh, during the initial uh, meeting, we set up an initial set of like, these are the areas where we think should improve stuff. And we write this in the sort of like RFP. Um, but also during the initial meeting with the retainers, we, we present a lot of these things in detail and we, we discuss them further with, with them and usually adjust in a sense where we prioritize our efforts as well. Right. If, if I can add, um, there is also an experimental element at times. Um, so to we, we will uh, have different uh, or, or depend on different security disciplines uh, with the purpose of attempting or experimenting uh, to see which uh, benefit the product uh, projects uh, significantly. And we had, have had security audits where fuzzing ended up being very important or where uh, the threat modeling was uh, was so important that it uh, that focusing on that uh, revealed uh, more findings um, than if we had let out the threat modeling. Um, so and, and uh, as well as the static analysis, we have also found issues with um, with static analysis uh, when when that in that goal. So yeah. Uh, that's next it slide. for goals. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. So this is uh, an example table of contents is uh, for Istio work uh, an Istio gauge maybe did, I think, I can't remember net now, uh, roughly eight months ago or so. Um, and that's sort of an example of where you can see how the goals are manifested in, in the report itself. There's a, a fussing section, there's a threat model section, there are an issues found section with, which just lists issues. There's uh, an assessment of, of Salsa, which is kind of related to the in a sense, release process. Um, so for uh, supply chain security. And then there is uh, the second last section is review of fixes for issues from previous audit, which is kind of a, a different section because Istio had a previous work done with a lot of issues found and they needed to assess where they were correctly fixed. So that's sort of specific to Istio in that sense. Um, and it's fair to say that uh, based on the table of contents, the, the vast majority of content itself in terms of pages are in the issues found section, uh, which is 33 pages long, uh, significantly more than, than the rest of them. Um, small highlight. And uh, so that's just to give a little bit of clarity in terms of how it manifests itself, the goal and, and the audit and, and so on. Um, next slide, please. And we also put a result summarized uh, in each report. And this is where we try to encapsulate uh, well what the report found and, and what we think of the, are the most important aspects of the, of the audit. And as we can see, it's, it's very technical in the sense that it's basically a, a quanti quantifiable summary in that sense. Um, and yeah, I don't think that there's much to discuss more here, but also just to lay a bit of groundwork for further discussion. Um, a few uh, links if you, are, if, you, if you need them just to see how, well, I guess this is also important to say. So these are links to the 
announcements for each uh, audit. So uh, an important step for the CNCF is that we come out with publishable artifacts that can be used to show and uh, distribute the work uh, and sort of present it to the world in that sense. And these are links to the announcements, not to the reports. And just to get uh, a an, an, uh, feeling of how uh, the CNCF likes to take the work further. Um, next slide, please. So uh, the conclusions uh, around sort of all of the security orders we have done so far is something along the lines of what we present on these slides. We've done a, a lot of uh, audits continuously. And uh, the focus of the, of the audits are both to uh, cover the technical aspects and in a sense also to improve the project's workflow pro processes. For example, the, the threat model can be a, an important part then looking at the release process and so on, where we look at sort of what salsa level compliance they, they are at and how they can reach a higher level of compliance and so on are, are, are important for the workflow. Um, we have some quantifiable results and, and then we have listed four categories where we think uh, most of the security improvements, uh, uh, we can bucketize them. Uh, the application security, that's kind of from the, from the manual auditing work. The security automation, which is often improvements of the, the CI, improvements of the fussing infrastructure, and so on. Software supply chain, which is often related to SALSA compliance. And then uh, security policies, which is in a sense related to both the threat model, as we often will and also sort of the, both the threat model and also the uh, security disclosure process. That was what Adam talked about, how we help and engage with the maintainers in, in establishing an appropriate security disclosure process and also how they can triage uh, triage issues with respect to how secu security relevant a, a given issue is, which is kind of related to the threat model. Um, next slide, please. So moving forward, what should we do to, uh, what can we do to improve this? And there are probably many areas. I think in general, um, my overall thought is, uh, we'd like to hear also some input from you in terms of uh, pros and cons of, of, of what we have been, been doing. And then also um, what are the, just sort of how you digest the reports and, and what you move for, like what, what you do with them as, as we haven't really, uh, we, we don't really know that uh, in reality. It's, it's all sort of guesswork from us. I, I would say educated guesswork, but uh, but still it's uh, it hasn't been uh, made explicit. And then, um, yeah, I think, I think that's it. Yep. Thanks, David and Adam. So I wanted to kind of bring everyone together to talk about this because um, in the course of performing due diligence on several projects that are seeking to move levels, particularly ones that have undergone an audit, when we're reviewing the security audit that's been conducted on these projects, it has a lot of really great information um, for project maintainers. And um, at KubeCon, when I was talking with a few maintainers that had recently undergone uh, an audit, whether or not it was by AdaLogix or another entity, um, there was some expressed challenges that they had associated with it. One, understanding that prioritization that David had alluded to earlier is how do we understand which findings are the most important ones that we are taking into consideration for remediation, which ones can wait in the context of the project because it's not going to be the same for every single project. How do we fundamentally introduce more secure processes or guides or recommendations to projects so that they could potentially eliminate whole classes of findings? Um, Justin. Can we uh, do an end user survey to find out what end users want? Because end users are the other customer mm -hmm. for these. And I don't know that we've ever asked them what they would like to see. And I'd be really interested in what they say as well. Because I think that um, that they're, they're the kind of the other, they're the stakeholder that's not really represented at any point in this process at the moment. Yep, I think that is a great call out. Duffy? You're muted. I agree that end users are, are definitely not um, uh, like represented in, in, the, in the view of this. I think 
other stuff that would be useful is like looking at one of the reports in the executive summary piece of this, the um, in the overall assessment, having some function around like licensing review, supply chain security review, security incident review process. You did mention that you go through a security review. Um, you know, you would open a CBE if you found one that is actually reasonably sustainable. But I would I would argue that that probably should just be like you know probably should go through that every time regardless. Um, and just validate that they actually have that the project has a mechanism by which they can handle things like security response and review um and then making those things part of the um making those things part of the overall assessment i think would be really useful to the toc because these are things specifically that are going to come up in our due diligence yep um that's a good point. I, definitely making sure that any of the processes that are described as far as the security of the project are fully exercised continuously and not that it's just a one off that it was that it worked. Um, that's a good call out as well. Uh, other TUC members, um, when you're reviewing security audits, are there things that you'd like to see that come out of them? Are there questions that you have regarding the content and even those TUC members or maintainers on the call? Um, how has your experience been with undergoing an audit? Are there changes that you'd like to see that would be beneficial for you? One of the rather basic things is with my Prometheus head on, we didn't always have people who were deeply familiar with Go as a language, which sometimes led to interesting results in the first round. This is more on the how to do it, not on the result set, but this is something which has come up once or twice. Ray? Well, sure, I understood that was your point. We should have people involved that are not experienced in a certain language, or we should not have or no, we should we should okay like we had discussions about the pprof endpoint being enabled and being surprisingly activated in the go binary and we're like this is how you do stuff um highly specific example but this is something which which came up uh, and didn't we didn't like it as a project let's let's put it this way okay okay Hey folks, uh, so um, I'm the subproject lead for the Kubernetes uh, Six Security External Audit, and we just released uh, an audit, not just, so it was in April of 2023. Um, what we've learned was also helpful was the since projects are maturing, uh, this is this was the second uh, external audit for Kubernetes. What helped us was also a review of the first one of 2019 and to publish that review, uh, like what if any issues were still open, uh, issues were closed from, from that audit, um, any and uh, if they're still open, why uh, as well, just to be transparent and have that, we published that in a blog on Kubernetes.io. So it was helpful and it was it was a totally different crew that as well that ran the 2019 audit versus the uh, the one that was published this year. So that, that, that helped uh, the, the the Kate's project in that as well. Um, scope can be very big. <laughs> I mean, the Kubernetes project is very big. So uh, the scope, um, there's not, we couldn't fit everything in scope for the audits. And there's always things that we want to, you know, we want to click next as well. So that's also something for us that, uh, to help keep in mind of uh, that the scope uh, can't be too big. And, and that sets a, that also kind of uh, presets a roadmap for the next audit or next audits, so which ones we miss, what scope or what what parts of the project we miss, and what we want to include, and uh, so that kind of helped with the the lessons learned there. So just want to make a few points. Thank you. So kind of, if I understand correctly, in a sense, specifying the limitations of what was done, such yeah. that a next team can pick up on on those limitations. Exactly. Forward yeah. is also important. I yeah. think that's that's uh, super key. Yeah. It's also uh, it's interesting what you mentioned with all the issues because we did because we did that with Istio, um, where, and this is mentioned in the report, um, where we reviewed old uh, issues from old uh, an old audit, and it was also a new team in Istio, and they weren't, uh, like it wasn't very explicit where this issue is fixed by this this place or and sometimes it was difficult to sort of assess whether where the fix was and so on. And I guess this is kind of related also, like tracking had not been done. Uh, 
as well as it could be. And I think uh, it's kind of related to what Emily said in the sense of they might not have had, uh, the prioritization might not have been there in a sense that it wasn't clear which one should should be uh, addressed as, 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 I guess, which one should be addressed first and so on. And they might have gotten a little bit lost or like uh, there might have been a little bit too much to digest in a, in a meaningful manner. There's a difference between here's 50 issues, you're welcome. And here's 50 issues and these five, they were the ones you check first. And then we have the next batch of bucketize them and categorize them into a little bit more sort of structured manner, uh, I think could, could help in, in such cases. One of the areas that we had also talked about was some of the trade-offs between um, going with one recommendation for a, for a fix versus another and trying to make that a little bit more transparent to maintainers. For individuals that have contributed to the projects or maintainers or TOC members that have had this in a past life, um, do you all often find that understanding those trade-offs or having them explained um, at as a contributor to a project are beneficial in understanding what are the next steps? How do we do this as a path forward than the courts? And then making a documentation decision around that, explaining why we chose to do something a particular way instead of another. We see this a lot with some projects and some of their feature design discussions, but not necessarily for security issues as they come up or security design decisions. Um, I think, uh, we often find uh, the way projects make decisions is based on what they interpret as the state of the art. So for example, at some point SALSA was heavily promoted and then they made the decision of we should integrate uh, various prominent features such that we could achieve this thing. Uh, so I think it's often understood by reference rather than necessarily from a first principle type of approach, um, which, is, which is still uh, great. Um, I think uh, that's one of my thoughts there. Right, I, I can uh, add another one. Uh, performance versus security is also a very, very typical one. So um, a missing security check um, or adding a missing security check uh, can affect performance. And that's where it, it typically where it becomes very difficult to for projects in the, in the orders to, to, to come up with a quick fix for, for an issue. Yep. Um, another item that we had talked about was around the security boundary associated with some of the findings or conducting the audit on the project. In some cases, it's very clear what is in scope of the project and what is considered a security design issue or just a finding against the project. And in other cases, it's a little bit ambiguous. Um, it's a little bit unclear whether or not it's the project's responsibility to implement that fix or if it's an upstream or another project that they rely upon or if it's a configuration requirement on on the adopter to take under consideration for their individual deployment environments. Um, have others experienced this, this kind of quandary and, and been forced to make that kind of decision? And how, how, do you, how do you justify where that boundary is? And how do you document that for, for adopters, for contributors that are looking at it? Justin? Uh, a lot of the time, in my experience with that, what's come out with that is that the project disputes the findings of the auditors, and it's not it's not actually very helpful because it just sits there being disputed and there's no not not necessarily a resolution which is definitely a problem because that just kind of leaves it leaves it open and there's no kind of there's never a resolved decision I often on those they just get left and or closed as won't fix or something which is oh, tends to be unhelpful so I kind of rather it got resolved at the audit time um, and a clear policy was written and it was then clearly documented one way or the other of what the decision was about that rather than being left to post audit when it, there's less pressure to actually say come down to say one thing clearly. Duffy and then Richie. What do you think? <coughs> Yeah, I mean, I do think these, these things do struggle a bit because of the system, because of that. But I think 
there's two parts to it also one is that like this is sort of a question about secure defaults like if you're going to have a configurable uh, element are you are you choosing a more secure default or are you choosing one that's easier to configure at the time and when doing a security review it might be nice to identify and i think that you probably do this you probably identify those places where um, configuration could be made more secure by the way you know than than what the, whatever the default might be and then the challenge you have is do you open an issue against that or do you uh, just document that because if it for the most part people who are consuming a security audit as a vendor when they see that you're not opening an issue against a particular issue that falls right to the bottom of the list of things to solve or to resolve because they don't particularly care so i am curious like from Ada's perspective, how they address that quandary, because like, I, th is that, I think that's where you're kind of going, Emily, but I'm not sure. Yep. Adam or David, uh, if you wanted to respond, go ahead, and then Richard. Right. I, yeah, right. Uh, so I, I can, I have a real quick, and then I can leave it to you, David. But uh, I, so, mm -hmm. the, so there are also some pos positive sides uh, from a project saying or a project uh, simply disputing or re refuting a, a, a security issue in the sense that it's very clear to the to the project that it it doesn't fall into our our scope of uh, of the our security model um, and that's a very positive sign as well that the pro it's clear to the maintainers and the security team uh, where the, the the boundaries are it can be that we disagree on that, but at least it, the, the project's uh, policy is uh, very clear. Um, so I, 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 I like that. I, I, I think that there's a positive outcome um, sometimes to, to the project um, uh, kind of being or rejecting a security issue uh, for the reason that it do, it do, it's not in their security um, scope. Yeah, and that's exactly how we essentially resolve it. And I would say it's it's positive when they refute it because that shows the boundary. And then what we say is we, we, we tell them it's just just document it and that's that. Just specify in your threat model, you do not care about this and you do not take any responsibility for that and don't expose this and so on and so on. And and then they're good. And in in general, in this case, we really refer to the envoy threat model who have a, an excellent documentation that says very clearly we do not care about all of this we only care about this and it's a it's a somewhat simple threat model but it's a, it's a really good one to show how how opinionated they are in terms of where this boundary is so that's kind of how we we often uh, trigger like we we, we say them. We, we we sort of direct the, the conversation because we plenty of times have we report issues and they say it's not really an issue is it and then we say well if it's not an issue just document it that this is not an issue because of this, this, and that, and we don't consider this in our scope. And for example, like uh, uh, the most common example is probably when we assess security vulnerabilities that require a little bit of privileges within the system. So you can either have a completely external attacker from 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 a place you are not affiliated with, and so on, or you can have someone that might have a little bit of uh, permissions. And usually when you increase the, the permissions a little bit, it's still within some threat model, a security issue, but a lot of uh, maintainers might not consider that a relevant, uh, you should trust sort of all that have crossed this level of permissions within the system. And that's where we then sort of like clarify these. So um, we usually, to summarize, we usually make it explicit, either you should document it or we should fix it. And that's kind of right. That. It if I can add, so then the next thing is, of course, once it is completely crystal clear for the project, then they can start, the project can independently start to discuss on and work on whether it's the correct uh, thread model and the correct approach, but but at least it, it's, it's crystal clear um, what it is, what, what, the, what the security boundary is. Thanks, Adam and yeah. David. So, Richie? Last one, last one. Okay. Could I say last thing? I guess the key thing is we, we tell them to be opinionated. They should have an opinion on where the boundary is and that's that we leave them that to them they can make their own decision on what they want but they should have a clear opinion okay thanks richie so tying in with justin's point and also what just has been said again speaking from experience um even if if a project clearly documents their security boundaries are the auditors might not always agree with with the boundaries and in the end uh 
this leads to a lot of discussions and sometimes again with the PPROF stuff and such also just misunderstandings on the auditor's side. Um, and the two things or the thing which we came away with was making certain that everything is clearly documented in the report, also disagreements and everything. But uh, taking a step back, maybe instead of trying to lawyer clear boundaries and, and being super explicit upfront, maybe we should just have a little bit of an arbitration mechanism or a third pair of eyes who are neither from the project nor from the auditors and look over the thing and basically also give input from, from that level to, to make certain that neither the project nor the reviewers are pushing too hard. I think that's a good recommendation. We'll have challenges finding individuals within the community that are capable of serving that capacity. Um, the thing that comes to mind is Tag Security's security buddy program that they run or um, potentially a modification of one of their reviews that they have just to side saddle um, and review the, the draft report and understand kind of where some of the conflict or the challenges are and where some of the potential trade-offs or value add to the project. Because there could potentially be occasions where the recommendation that's coming from the auditors might be outside of what the uh, project maintainer's initial scope was, but would be beneficial from an adopter's perspective or an end user's perspective if the project were to take on that remediation, for instance. What other thoughts and experiences do folks have that we could as, provide with AdaLogix to potentially improve those reports, either um, as a TUC member consuming them? I mean, I've shared a lot of my observations and my experience with reviewing these reports, but I, I'm keen to hear from others because I know that my opinions are just one-sided. <laughs> Um, Adalogix, do you have any other questions for us um, if there was anything that we didn't discuss here on the call? I guess a, a bit of a, it would be nice to have some, so I have one specific question and then another comment. Uh, just mention something with NDAs also, at the, at the initial question 20 minutes ago, I didn't quite get that. Uh, could I have that repeated perhaps? for my notes. Uh, didn't say NDA, so I'm just trying to think what I did say. It was related to asking the project, uh, sorry, the the vendors um, about their experiences oh, the end, with the asking, the, no, no, asking the end users, the end user about what they want, because they're the people not being represented at the moment in this discussion. Okay, that makes a lot more sense now. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I guess uh, my, my question would be um, moving forward, we, we'd like to take some initiatives to adjust these uh, reports and, and we are coming up with reports in the, in, in the immediate almost and it makes sense to do that. I think, uh, I don't know what you prefer, but what we could do is we could uh, include what we think is would make sense. Uh, we can sort of send an email to, to Emily and, and the rest and, and highlight this was a, like we did this for this specific purpose. Uh, let us know if this makes sense uh, based on, on your comments and, and where that essentially, I guess we could establish a little bit of a con continuous communication, slight communication to, to adjust as we move along. If, if that's the, if, if people are happy with that type of, of improving this. Yep. I think that would be good. Sending a summary of some of the changes that you're looking to make in an upcoming audit to the TOC public mailing list, I think would be fantastic. Um, for us, I think, Amy, if we could look at getting an end user survey pulled together regarding the usability of audits by end users and what features they'd like to see um, added or in improving the clarity on them for their consumption, I think that would be beneficial. And then we can share that with the auditors. Maybe. Um, okay. most of the, like the reason I'm saying maybe is because that's not the area of expertise that's Taylor uh, Dolezal decision. So um, I'll bring it up with Taylor and see if there's something either currently in the works or um, if there's something already planned. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, like no promises, but like I see where we're going with this. I like the idea, but like, you know, not stepping on toes here. Yep. Cool. Okay. I think I think there's potentially other options with end users as well. I think like inviting them to be part of the audit process like some of the, some of the customers of the project for example 
I don't know. I think there's there's potentially other things we could do to involve them more. One minor caveat here is I just wanted to highlight that usually audits are quite condensed. There's a lot of work in a relatively short period of time. So it's not as if there's a scope for, in a sense, putting in, introducing a lot more as, you know, so like all the time is already allocated in a sense. So it would be kind of, um, we should also think about that. Um, yeah, because yeah, it might, absolutely. In, in, introducing new stuff might remove other stuff and even confuse the user anymore. Just, just, just a small note I, I thought about when we yeah. were going over. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. And if they're not available to be involved on the right time scale, it's not useful either. It's something um, that we can definitely talk to Taylor about um, in that end user survey if, if he's willing to put that together or even um, collecting some concerns from adopters ahead of time before audit so that the auditors understand kind of like where they want some focus to occur or at least maybe address a small portion of it within the report for, for different projects. Uh, there's some chat. Um, Duffy's talking about part of the review of a project for end user surveys, um, pulling any security concerns. If you can talk to that, Duffy. Yeah, I was saying part of the review of a project is like we'll interview people who are using the project and get their thoughts about the project. And it may be useful in that time to poll for security concerns that the, that the consumer of the project has about the project and feed that back into the loop. I'm not sure exactly how we could like, you know, make that part of the process, but it seems like that would be useful. I think very useful, not only for auditors, but like even the maintainers themselves as well, I think. Yeah, I think uh, especially useful as well to to have information about how the project is being deployed and used, uh, which environments and uh, how how open is it uh, to the world, um, etc. It's 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 not often, but it happens that we ask the projects of what are some typical uh, uh, deployment uh, patterns, for example, of a of a given project, and it's not super clear to to the to the maintainers. And so that, that will be useful information for sure. Yep. Anything else? I think one last comment on this, what Dolphy suggested, it kind of also ties back to the security boundary as that might be used for establishing where should the boundaries be. If uh, suddenly a lot of customers or, or users of the project come out and say, we use it this way, but the maintainers actually don't consider this as something that should be secure of using it that way it might have <laughs> impact. <laughs> right. As, as an anecdote, we have done a security audit um, where a, an issue was reported by another team a year uh, before we did our audit. And we reported the same audit to the project. And in that year uh, time span of one year, the, the, the same issue became a very a severe security issue because the use case had changed um, and suddenly uh, reading the local file system was not untrusted anymore. Um, so that, that's something that, that will, will help uh, several parties. That's a good call out. We've talked about um, highlighting what are the security features and functionality of different portions of the project so that they could be watched more closely um, when pull requests are reviewed by maintainers for inclusion and understanding the impact of what those changes look like. Um, so that's a good call out to have. Well, I would like to thank Adalogix um, for their time and, and talking through how, they're how they conduct an audit and everyone sharing their experiences with it. I think overall, um, the discussion and some of the recommendations that have come out of it will greatly increase the usability of the audits for a variety of interested parties, maintainers, TUC members, potentially end users and adopters as well. Um, so thanks, everyone. We really appreciate your time today. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.